Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to Dell 3i Insights and Intelligence with AI Leadership Roundtable Session Series. Uh, the topic for today is Problem Solving at Scale with AI, the new playbook. And before I talk about the topic, just a quick introduction about 3AI. 3AI is India's largest platform for AI analytics aspirants and professionals. Over the previous years, 3AI has successfully curated, we spoke 85 plus knowledge insight sessions, five large scale events, 25 plus leadership roundtable sessions, 20 plus expert talks, and in allied interventions covering end-to-end -end topical strategic as well as operational spectrum of AI analytics and data science themes uh, and topics for our 11,000 plus growing 3AI members through top of line marquee 350 plus AI analytic thought leaders who represent across 295, 290 plus organizations and GCCs. Overall, if I look into 3AI, it has a whopping outreach and a talent outreach with 125 plus academic institutions covering 0.2 million students. Uh, 3i events and programs have been attended by 0.3 million participants, grossing around 4.8 million impressions across social channels. Today's topic is really interesting uh, in this age of what I call VUCA, which is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which is not new, new to all of you. In this world, and specifically the industry 4.0 revolution, AI continues to dominate the business and technology landscape and AI is becoming what we call ubiquitous. Business challenges, problems amongst the C-suit are turning out to be immensely complex and enterprises are also looking into uh, what we call unforeseen and unresolved problems across the business functions. They are looking into solutions which are uh, which can be looked into at scale with AI. And going forward with the acceleration of AI adoption, all problems will be reframed what we call as AI problems. And when we think of humans and machines, as opposed to humans versus machines, there needs to be a balance between driving forces and restraining forces. There needs to be uh, appropriately discussions, uh, decisions taken on to make real progress uh, in this VUCA world. So this Insights and Intelligence Roundtable Series session will have eminent seasoned, it, ha it has eminent and seasoned AI analytic leaders from marquee organizations. And uh, they will be specifically covering multiple facets around AI, how it is becoming mainstream to solve large, complex, unresolved problems at scale with enterprises. A quick, quick introduction of the speakers today. We have Serge. Serge is the global operations leader at ABN Bev. Serge has grown from through a non-traditional career spanning multiple countries functions. Uh, Serge moved to India to establish the ABN Bev Global Capability Center and operations with more than thousand plus professionals. And the center runs finance, commercial, and people operations for multiple ABN Bev zones. Uh, in terms of becoming an intelligent operation powered by AIML. Surge also comes with a wealth of business equity through roles in B2B sales, IT operations management, FMCG, logistics supply chain, finance and operations. We also have Subroto Ghosh or Shubho, who is the head of data analytics and actuarial at Allstate. Shubho is a business leader with rich and relevant experience around service offerings like analytics, big data, AI, intelligent automation, outsourcing, business consulting, to name a few. And Shubo also has significant experience in terms of a good mix between sales enablement, solution design, and delivery. We also have Anupam Gupta, who is the VP for Enterprise Data Analytics at Optum. Anupam is a seasoned analytics leader with two decades of demonstrated experience in big data analytics capabilities across banking, insurance, and healthcare. He currently leads the AIML capability solutions and products at United Health Group. And prior to that, he has spent a decade in the analytics consulting world uh, around retail banking, insurance across Euro US, Europe, across the globe. We also have Dyanish Bode. He's also called Dan. He's the leader for co-creation labs at WNS 
Global Services. Uh, he spearheaded and facilitated multiple design-led interventions across industries, from conducting intense design-led workshops to creating what we call design thinking workshops to, to creating what we call a design thinking customer experience. His spectrum of experience in design thinking covers human-centered design, whether it's UX design, CX design, you name, and, and we have it for, for Dan. This round table will be moderated by Praveen Kumar. Praveen Kumar is the field marketing leader for Dell Technologies, works uh, uh, and has been associated with Dell Technologies for 14 years, spanning multiple roles and responsibilities. Uh, in terms of product lifecycle management, product marketing, and most importantly, to overall evangelize the workforce transformation and work from anywhere adoption. Praveen has been instrumental in consulting and extended exponential technologies, AIML, in enhancing user experience and endpoint devices. Uh, as I read and talk about the introduction of the speakers, I, I just want to say wow to the immense line of speakers which we have, as well as the moderation which will happen with Praveen. So Praveen, over to you for, for this session. And I'm I, as well as the audience, is really looking forward to this power packed session today. Thank you so much, Kapil. Um, you exactly caught my attention with the word wow, because this is a great panel of uh, you know eminent and experienced you know, professionals. <clears throat> from the uh, industry. It's great to have all of you here today. And uh, uh, believe it or not, I'm going to learn a lot you know, from all of you guys. Thank you so much for taking your time out. <clears throat> um, today, I think uh, we've heard about, heard about a lot of news, again, with Delta variants and pandemic coming in a different form and so on and so forth. But all this started about 18, 19 months back, isn't it? Uh, when the pandemic you know, uprooted the way we work uh, how we work, <coughs> where, we, where we started uh, transformation uh, from a greater scale. Now, how have you, uh, if I may probably, you know, go on to Anupam, how have you seen in your organization post-pandemic in terms of problem solving and critical thinking capabilities within your organization has changed or how has it now seeped into your organizational strategy Maybe it's IT strategy or business strategy. First and foremost, if I remember, most of most of the industrial players were went into BCP mode. Um, you know, try to get things done and get into that mode. Having said that, how do you think the problem-solving capabilities are now finding different forms within your organization and especially within your company strategy? Anupam? Sure, Praveen. Great question and very pertinent for us. So just to give you a little bit of background on Optum United Health Group, that will help you understand the context of my answers. We are the largest healthcare company in the United States. Right? So we have the maximum number of members that we serve as an insurance company. That's United Healthcare. And as Optum, we work with hospitals, care providers. We provide care uh, because you know, Optum Care is in itself a care delivery organization. So we are on both sides. We we, we manage hospitals. We we have insurance that uh, provides health insurance to government, to commercial establishments, and so on and so forth. So uh, the pandemic was obviously, uh, it changed everything about how we were uh, running our business. Immediately, the focus turned towards figuring out what do we need to do to help our members out. Right, because initially the, the pandemic rate was growing so fast, we had to track it. We had to see if we can uh, move faster than it and try and prevent it. At the same time, we had to provide more coverage, even identify people who don't have coverage and see what we can do for them, work with the government to see what can be done to be able to cover the costs. And at the same time, move towards uh, what is now called telemedicine or try and put more uh, consultations through videos, right, which immediately increased the amount of unstructured data that we were getting. Suddenly, we had uh, so many consultations that were happening over telephone or, or over video. So you put all of that together. It essentially did two things. It immediately necessitated that the different part of the organization works together. Right. So the contact centers, the analytics teams, the data teams, the operations, all of them had to put their strengths together and immediately 
uh, try towards making sure that there was one seamless experience for our members or our customers in the way they were interacting with us. Now, that in itself broke the silos across the organization in the way we were looking at experience across all of these different touch points that members have with us. When, when they're going to a hospital, when they're submitting a claim, when they're calling our contact centers, you know, how do we bring all of that together and move towards what we call consumerism? How do we ensure that there is a, a more and more focus on consumer experience and improving it? Now, that might seem simple that, you know, improving consumer experience. But for a company that is operating in healthcare and, and operates end to end from providing medical services to being able to process claims, that essentially means that you have to rethink the entire value chain. And, and that's where AI becomes, uh, you know, central to how we operate. Right. So if, where, where all can we embed uh, intelligence? Can we predict what our members are likely to call us for? When somebody calls into our contact center, can our agents already have information available so that our members don't have to tell them in advance of what they're calling for? And they already have a good idea of what they're likely to call for, which will help solve their queries faster. You know, that's one very simple example. Can we predict which particular members are likely to have complications from their diseases better? So disease prediction was suddenly at, at the focus and all of the work that we'd been doing suddenly became very relevant. Even from a data standardization standpoint, how do we bring together the intelligence that we were getting from all of these member touch points and pull it together to be able to create an, a holistic member centric strategy is, is what really was, uh, you know, the pandemic in a way catalyzed all of those things to happen within United Health Group. Great. And in fact, uh, I really liked uh, the element of AI in this. What you rightly said is, different teams coming together to work together, um, trying to solve problems in a critical way where you have more intelligence. And at the same time, now you found this to be the new way and it's actually helping corporations like you to transform exactly. and improve and actually service your clients better. Yeah. Right. Great. Exactly. Thanks, Anupam. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, over to you, Serge. You know, your company owns most of my favorite brands. I told you about this earlier. And, and needless to say, Anupam, I, I actually wanted to also let you know that uh, United Health Group and Optum specifically are one of the trusted partners for Dell Technologies as well. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> going back to you, Serge, right. it's like, um, how have you seen yeah. globally in, in, in your company in, 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 or maybe in the organization which you're involved with, how has this uh, IT strategy or business strategy adoption towards mm. AI to solve the problems in operations, maybe to customer centric, whatsoever it could be. What's yeah, your take uh, on this? No, so as you said, now we're a beer company, so which means we have been around for 600 years. Right? One of our brands has been around. Literally, this is not marketing speech. This is this is reality because I come from that city where Stella Artois is brewed, uh, and so Stella Artois, or at least the Artois brand, exists already since 1366. So you can imagine. A company going back 600 years at a certain point they also need to evolve no throughout those 600 years you continuously need to evolve and here as well i think in the recent uh, couple of years we really started our analytics ai journey only as recent as five years ago yeah? so we opened our office here five years ago in uh, in bangalore and we established our global analytics center um, and was we started off with i think 15 20 people that uh, started looking at use cases and how do we use AI in the in the beer sector. Yeah? But then, of course, COVID came a year and a half ago, and, and this whole thing accelerated. Yeah? And I think two two important things that we we saw in the company is one that we started using AI as a as a matter of survival. Yeah? Well, I'll give one example, but also strategically, we saw things really starting to change. So, as a matter of survival, um, you've seen here in India. Uh, we went through lockdowns around the world. We go through lockdowns, which means bars are closed, restaurants are closed, uh, shopping malls are closed. Here, even the whole alcohol sector was closed for two, three months. Yeah? So you can imagine the amount of impact that this has on us as a business, but also on our customers. Yeah? The bars, restaurants, these are our customers. So if they go through difficult times, not good for our business and, of course, also a financial risk for us. So one thing that has accelerated throughout the pandemic is how do we use AI 
ML in this whole receivables uh, part of the business, right? How do we need to review our credit risk models? Because all the credit risk models of the past, yeah, they kind of become obsolete if you go through this kind of unprecedented event like, like COVID. You need to take into account different types of data that you weren't using before to really predict whether a certain customer might go bankrupt or not. And we've all seen, I think here in Bangalore, several you know, restaurants and bars closing. Yeah, a lot of them survived, thankfully, but also several of them have closed, which is a financial risk for them, but also for us, right? So we started using a lot more AI ML at a global level in the in the OTC area, forecasting our overdues at a customer level, at an invoice level, to really be, make sure that we can collect the cash where needed. But we have to find a balance between collecting the cash no, surviving for AB InBev, but also yeah, needing to make sure that the bar survives. Yeah? So we had a lot of programs then where we supported the, the bar. So that's from a survival perspective, a big acceleration in reviewing our models and really applying analytics in collecting cash, in predicting overdues, reviewing uh, the credit risk model, etc. Strategically, what we've seen is a massive acceleration in our business towards e-commerce and and direct to consumer and so as a traditional company we typically distribute through uh through retailers to wholesalers um but yeah as all of those were closed or a lot of them were closed uh, around the world we accelerated fortunately we had a first presence in e-commerce and, and some direct to consumer platforms already around the world so we were able to accelerate and that, of course, then requires the use of, of AI, whereas before a lot of those platforms were still rather small, volume was kind of in a pilot stage. Now we are accelerating our analytics through those platforms, right? How can we upsell? How can we recommend different FQUs? How do we manage out of stock? How do we improve the delivery time? So I think those are the two things that I've seen in the last more or less two years where AI is now really accelerating. And we see from our our CEO, the direction today, one of the top five priorities is tech and analytics, right? So becoming a real tech and analytics company in the beer business. Awesome, awesome. And, and uh, let's just say not everybody is as gifted as you to work in a company like yours. But <laughs> uh, having said that, you know, that's great, you know, new dimension, uh, Serge, what you mentioned. While, you know, we were talking about uh, our meeting our end clients and end customers' expectations through business operations. One thing which you brought out is it is beautiful, managing the supply chain. Uh, yeah. So analytics and intelligence is just not restricted to certain functions. It expands throughout, you know, at all the functions of the company. That's a great point. Yeah, and, right. and, and needless to say, in Dell Technologies, you know, most of you would probably have heard about the supply chain challenges which is happening in the semiconductor industry. So we've also got into predictive analysis of our uh, supply chain, how we could do better. And we've turned out to be great by adopting AI strategy. Thank you so much, uh, Serge, for that particular view. Uh, over to you, Shubo. Uh, what's your take on AI adoption of uh, into your company strategy? How have you seen that changing in the last 18, 20 months? After such a uh, long <laughs> speech, the only data visualization which was coming to my mind was bar charts. So, wow, that's a great one. Yeah. So coming from, uh, you know, let me talk about, you know, while, you know, the, uh, products of such companies are mostly for celebration and sometimes to uh, put down the sorrows as well. But insurance, unlike many other business, is a peculiar business which is uh, whose basic premise is to premise is to stand by our customers when things are not really going well right if you meet with a motor accident your you know somebody dies or somebody is sick in the hospital or the home is flooded and and that is where perhaps our asset test is and I, if i have to talk a little bit about uh, you know even before we go into the concept of ai or its implementation or adoption if you take a step back and look at that, where are we coming or approaching this entire thing from? And, you know, there are, I would say there are four C's which really came into play in the last couple of years. And the one big C is universal, which is the COVID. So I'm dropping that off. The three other C's which I will talk about, the first and foremost is continuity. Every business was hit. Every kind of business was hit. And continuity was a questionable thing. And when I say continuity, it is not just the continuity whether my shop will remain open, but how do I continue even? Even if I see my bank, you know, 
cash balances are really good and then they have deep pockets. I can survive three years of pandemic and whatever it is. But nevertheless, that how do I continue to run the business as usual, the BAU part itself, that is one. The other thing which suddenly came into play is that uh, the entire factor of being together was hit. The office is disintegrated in its usual term. Uh, the society went into lockdown and all of it. So collaboration, the other C, which I will talk about, is, is was something which evolved as, uh, you know, the, the biggest need of organizations, businesses, society, everything, and which was not so much prominent or pronounced, even though always it existed. That was the second one. The third C I will talk about is the customer experience management. Now, it may sound cliched, but customer experience took a completely different turn because the customer is no longer the end customer. They are also as much as affected as the business uh, with this entire pandemic and the scenario. Their lives are changing because they are a consumer. They are also producer. They are working somewhere, right? So those jobs are going through different you know, turmoil. Their consume, consumption pattern is hit. And Serge gave a fantastic example as, and, and I have seen the long queues when the when the liquor stores opened so in all aspects i would say that you know everything be it groceries be it medical facilities all of it was disrupted and in those times especially for an insurance company i think the biggest hit was that how do we manage our customer experience because uh, you know we accept it or not but insurance as i say it is a regrettable necessity and uh, we don't need an insurance uh, if things are going well we need when things don't go well, right? When things run, uh, you know, bad. And therefore, if I, if you look at it, I think we try to play it uh, even from an automation or AI or machine learning and all those technologies were there. But more importantly, we try to play it uh, by the uh, being driven by the customer experience. So one of the, I think uh, one of the first two companies, uh, uh, you know, Allstate was one which uh, returned back the premium to the tune of almost uh, 700 plus uh, million dollars or almost 800 million dollars to its customer for the simple fact that they were not driving their vehicles as much as they can now what could be a better example of a reverse usage based insurance earlier customers you know we we bring in ai we talk of machine learning when we started doing this usage based insurance maybe 15 years back and it was all based on customer data their driving behavior their uh you know uh, the, the the way of uh the how much they drove so both pay as you use and pay how much you use so all those kind of usage based insurance but here immediately jumping in and saying that yeah we still believe in the ethos of usage based insurance and since you are not using it it doesn't take ai to tell us that it should be returned so we started from there to be honest uh you know the global ai insurance ai in insurance market if you see it is touted to be or estimated to be about 7 billion by the year 2028 and and growing at a compounded annual growth rate of about 24 percent and it is no surprise because the insurance business unlike many other business which has adopted ai machine learning or the data driven decisioning if you will as as a part as the business's uh, customer experience needed to be changed the supply chain and other areas we but the core of insurance business has traditionally been data because we can't come up with a power pricing unless we know uh, i mean how much premium to charge for a 40 year old man uh, who is smoking it is all based on the on the data of the past uh, you know both uh, morbidity as uh, mortality rates right it is nothing but data analysis and then that uh, that premise is itself is very different so therefore our core business is impacted when these things happen. So when AI and ML, we look at it, it is it is bringing both the customer experience part as well as incorporating those into our core business. And uh, how that got impacted, let me take again a step back and look at the actuarial science by itself as a definition. It is It plays on the law of large numbers, honestly, and, and the probability, right? And from there, the traditional aspect has completely changed. Today, we are talking of hyper-personalization. We are talking of not only usage-based insurance, we are talking of cohorts, like if, you know, uh, maybe life insurance for dog owners. We are going into those kind of crazy 
a sounding but uh, you know from a data perspective perhaps making sense those kind of granularity so today actuaries have the huge potential to uh, change the whole pricing game because they have the computational power of modern machines today and then the power of data crunching at a much faster rate but then we are also challenged by the factor that how much is too much because ultimately insurance also by definition is spreading the risk amongst large people then only it with the impact will be lesser on each so it's a, it's a dichotomy that we mean so these are the basic foundational aspects i wanted to talk about because uh, for us as an insurer uh, ai uh, ml is is not so straightforward as other businesses uh, of course there are other areas where uh, we definitely uh, got driven into action is because for example when you have an auto accident or a motor accident in these pandemic days and all it is difficult to uh, go for loss assessment sending a loss assessor to the site the garage or all of it so i will take an example of uh, one of the all state innovation called quick photo claims where using the, the the mobile app that we have the all state app you can quickly take pictures of the the damaged car the user can take the insured can take and send it uh, upload it through the mobile itself and and our contact center uh, you know the loss assessor sitting at the contact center could assess the loss and quickly settle the claims but we are going one step beyond and adoption of ai and ml that today we are using uh, you know applications like label box and hartex to uh, label those images the thousands of images that are coming up and label those images and to define that you know tomorrow's world should see that as soon as the image comes in within next few seconds or few minutes it's passing through a machine learning algorithm which has been you know which has gone through supervised learning with those labeling that this is a fender damage this is a bumper damage this is a you know tail light broken and kind of things and what is the typical uh, loss which can one incur the damage or the repair cost and quickly settle those claims so imagine a world that where at least 80% or 90% of the claim value is immediately credited to the insured account within say one hour of uh, you know meeting with an accident so we want to be there and that is where uh, how are we there at the time of that crisis with our uh, with our customers and then that is where we want to go with that awesome okay. thank you so much uh, shubhoda actually you know i i'm a practical customer of your mobile application based you know uh, services I, I, and i just loved it time is of the essence at the same time when you had manual restrictions of meeting people to give a quotation or to assess damage you have to fall back on ai and ml technologies that's a great insight dan over to you uh, we've seen views coming from insurance healthcare services and fmcg as well but uh, yeah. what's happening in the services space how has services companies like yours transformed the you know into a way to adapt ai into your business operations and core business strategies yeah so uh, i'm going to start with uh, something that everybody has mentioned here on the call which is uh, customer experience now with our organization the thing is you know we're not just uh, talking about our client experience but for a lot of our clients their customer experience rests with us right so uh, we are the ones who are talking to their uh, end customers we are, let's say if i talk about insurance right it's uh, basically the our agents who are talking to these end customers who may be stuck in in an accident situation or some other situation like that so uh, and one of the key themes that we take up whenever we trying to problem solve is empathy and we said uh, you know how do we bring empathy and ai together and yes we need to provide great customer experience uh but before we talk about customers we also need to look at the people who are providing customer experience and that's really where the differentiation came in because we have what almost 50000 people uh the moment there were lockdowns we had to mobilize the entire workforce uh we not only had to think about how will we make sure that the customer experience levels do not drop but uh we had to very actively think about how can we deploy ai uh, you know assisted tools recommendation engines to reduce the cognitive load of all of these agents who are now working in a completely new environment uh using ai so that you know uh, the customer experience uh, levels do not drop across uh conversations and uh, other tasks that our uh, customers are doing uh, that our agents are doing uh the other thing that happened is uh, uh you know like um, 
uh, search mentioned or uh, value chains right the entire supply chains value chains they all changed fairly rapidly um and what we did is we went uh, uh, very hard on design thinking and systems thinking here uh we said what we'll do is uh, within design thinking you have uh, uh, something called uh, extreme scenarios where you pick up uh, uh, a universe where uh, you know the rules have changed to an extreme setup and you design according to those rules so we said uh, we will create system maps of uh, these uh, existing value chains of these uh, existing ecosystems and then we look at uh, from each stakeholders point of view customers point of view business owners point of view agents point of view and see what needs to change and what role should ai play in this change going forward so uh, you know for us it was not just uh, saying that you know we'll create bots which will you know automate a lot of stuff but it was really thinking about uh, you know what are the things that our agents and our end customers need us to do uh, and need us to do better given today's scenario and that's uh, the basis of how we uh, created strategy around where we want to deploy ai and how we want to design some of those tools Awesome. Dan, when you are there, uh, when you're there, so we spoke about value chains and external customers and customer experience. Um, most of our organizational employees within the organizations are also our customers in, in, in one way or the other, right? So how have you seen workforce transformation within organizations such as yours within this? And what's the dependency on AI to ease their work process or maybe in their functional roles? What, what kind of one or two quick brief things which you have seen noticing in your organization so okay firstly ai has a huge role like i mentioned uh, there's a huge cognitive load and primarily when you talk about cognitive load uh, and sorry i use a lot of design terms uh, but when you talk about cognitive load it essentially means the uh, pressure my brain undergoes whenever i have to take a decision right cognitive load is a direct uh, uh, function of how many decisions i'm taking as a human being the biggest thing that AI can help me do in this situation is help me make those decisions or rather give me enough confidence to make those decisions easily, which means uh, not only that you have availability of a lot of data, but uh, my analytics teams are able to construct narratives and stories and insights out of those, which enable me to take a lot of decisions at a lot faster pace, a lot uh, faster pace, which means uh, let's say if, if my agents are talking to end customer, then, you know, they're having a dis, uh, conversation around a product. My recommendation engine needs to decode the uh, emotions of that particular end user, apart from being able to connect uh, the keywords to the requirements that they have and quickly give me recommendations on things like pricing plans, product configurations that I can bring up and talk to my customer with. That's a great input. Yep, absolutely. Um, Anupam, what's to your views? What do you think internally for employees and workforce? This is the you know generation of millennials, dude, and they're pretty you know fast in adopting uh, technologies. You you don't give them the high tech. They just you know surveys indicate that just either they quit or they probably find another company to work with, which gives them whatever is necessary. So how have you seen uh, employees and workforce? or what functions your, how your IT has enabled you with various AI based problem solving skills or whatever within the organization. But yeah, Praveen, uh, again, good question. And with an organization with more than 200,000 employees, you're dealing with employees at, at different stages of their careers and, and life cycles. So while we have to take care of millennials, we also have to take, we also have to take care of people who have decades of experience behind them and make sure that everybody is able to do their job effectively and well. Right. So, uh, some of the things that I think Serge said, as well as uh, the rest of the panel said, one of the things that uh, the pandemic did was it, it created these uh, geographical distances people couldn't meet anymore. So right on the ground, uh, where people were able to come together and, and do problem solving together, just discuss, get in a room, use the whiteboard, you know, all of that completely went away. Now suddenly people were, you know, stuck at their home. So uh, suddenly, uh, tools, technology tools to be able to help them collaborate became extremely important. So collaborative tools became extremely important. So immediately our, our organization uh, moved to Microsoft Teams and, and rolled it out. I mean, it happened lightning fast. And, uh, you know, that helped, you know, bring all of collaborative tools for Excel, PowerPoint, being able to, to work on the same document uh, in a shared format became so much easier. Another very simple uh, 
capability that that brought to the fore was it helps you transcribe transcribe voice to text in real time during meetings right so if you're meeting with five seven eight ten people uh teams leverages the the azure stack for its transcription and it's extremely effective so, uh, so people don't have to take notes anymore you just uh, put the transcription on and it transcribes the entire meeting in real time it helps people save time on taking down notes it can help you go back and read up on some of the com comments that were said that i thought was was very helpful but that's just one part of the problem again there was one time during the during the peak waves in India as well as in other countries where we saw nearly 30% of our workforce becoming unavailable because either they themselves were dealing with, with COVID or somebody in their family was dealing with COVID. Can you imagine the amount of productivity loss that causes you know, 30 to 35% people are not available? And compassion is a core value for our company. So, right, we would stand by our employees, as you said, they're extremely important stakeholders. They were under no pressure to come back to work. So they 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 were given complete control to be able to take care of their health and 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 you know their family's health. Now, the only the only way to help our employees do that is to again improve the productivity of the workforce. Right. How do you do that? Well, robotic process automation immediately becomes extremely important. How much of RPA can you push on, on operational decisions like claim processing? How much of that can be automated? So we really push the boundaries of how, you know, how much automation can uh, be done in addition to what was already in place. Now, the next frontier is you begin to combine capabilities like natural language processing with robotic process automation. And suddenly you're in the realm of automation that hasn't been seen before, right? So how much of machine assisted decision making can happen on the basis of uh, the forms that you're getting, right? So how much of natural language processing can be combined with OCR technology, with robotic process automation to really push the boundaries of where exactly human intelligence is required versus where can machine intelligence do the job. And eventually we were able to significantly improve the overall productivity of the workforce, which will continue to deliver benefits over the coming years, right? Now that we've been able to do it, I think that's how we were able to really change the paradigm. Great. That's absolutely right. Collaborative and, you know, bringing in AI tech to work together. Absolutely right. And uh, uh, Shubo, your views on this, you know, how have companies adopted AI to improve productivity within, them, uh, within their organizations? Yeah, I will uh, start with a comment that if I have to give an award for the chief digital officer of the year, and that too for two consecutive years in a row, it would go to the pandemic. I think the biggest wind of change as well as learning is that remote works and works effectively. However, things have not been really easy, honestly, because work from anywhere is the new normal, but it required a lot of technology enablement. And, and, and no wonder that Zoom stock prices went, uh, you know, seven times up. But, you know, I would say that it is just not just the technology enablement or bringing in, in, in some of the aspects that, uh, you know, Anupam talked about. And it's a great tool, uh, the transcription, which happens that meeting notes are not required. You can just uh, take those. While th those were there, but I think it was uh, what was required also was the change in mindset. And that mindset enablement was also important. Because to be honest, we were all at, you know accustomed to the fact that there is a meeting invite in our calendar, but we don't have nothing further on the laptop. We will just walk into the meeting room or the huddle room, and then we will converse, right? Here today, we had, you know, it was a dual adoption under pressure. It was a, on one hand, the remote working and the collaboration became a reality. At the same time, we had to deliver on those circumstances. So there is no more turning my, you know, swivel, up, you know, swivel my chair and talk to my colleague and quickly say, I have to get to. And the situation is that either I will ping on the teams or get into a call. And mostly our calendars were filled with those 30 minute slots which could have been done in 10 minutes flat out if I could walk up to the my colleague, right? So it, it was a, both a social problem as well as a, as a technology problem. And that is how I see it. And the good part is that, you know, in, in especially in all, all state context, we uh, adopted both Teams as well as the Zoom kind of platform very effectively. And, and not only that, we, uh, you know, as and today, as you can see, I, I'm, I'm back to office, but today we are in a hybrid world. So the adoption doesn't stop there. The challenge is that 
uh, we are actually embracing and entering into a whole new world of working, which is a hybrid model. And today our meeting rooms had to be enabled with not only Zooms and Teams, which could be done from our uh, personal uh, machines and devices, but even the uh, it has to be integrated with the conference rooms being enabled, right? So that you get the, what we used to call in, in, in terms of customer experience as a uh, cross platform customer experience today, the employee experience also has to be the same. That means the person who is working from home doesn't feel left out of the uh, situation which is happening at all. So another tool which we adopted very effectively is called Mural, which is for the digital brainstorming, uh, breakout rooms, and especially in the agile world. So I think, you know, uh, the other thing I was talking about, the delivery, the problem solving became a mainstay. And, and uh, the bigger problem, of course, was the pandemic and COVID, et cetera. But the sudden remoteness and the fear of the pandemic both contributed to that. And while infrastructure played a major role, so did the delivery approaches, like the adoption of uh, methodologies like Agile skyrocketed. We discovered that Agile is the way to go because we are not together and you can really not have that continuity of a waterfall kind of a model, right? And even in the AI ML world, the ML ops got a shot in the arm. So overall, I think you know the way we adopted to this is enable our employees with the right technology, but at the same time, intervene socially to keep them engaged, to enable them. So we have had multiple learning sessions around what is the best way to collaborate virtually. What are the tips and tricks of Zoom? How can you, uh, you know, be effective in a meeting? So let me uh, bring in an interesting aspect, a couple of interesting aspects which I uh, did discover during the uh, during these you know, remote working or virtual thing. And then this has been actually uh, mentioned also for my few of uh, my colleagues that these virtual meetings have been a great leveler and then this is where i really like the the machine and uh, human interaction that in a meeting room you will typically remain silent when the senior is speaking because there is a visible expression and uh, you know and especially in an indian culture it is all the more evident but in a virtual environment uh, supposedly and then i have experienced that myself that people are free and more uh, forthcoming and they are talking and they're speaking because actually, except for your uh, display picture, nothing else is visible. So you feel much safer behind that to express the aspect of, of the technology intervention, which, which is actually helping in the productivity. Awesome. Awesome. That's that, that, that's a great sight. And in fact, I, I liked all the, uh, uh, yes, uh, Dan, to you. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I would agree with Subroto, right? One of the things that we have been doing very uh, effectively within the, you know, co-creation labs at WNS is utilizing tools like Mural, Miro, Figma, which really allow you to create these immersive digital whiteboards where you would be able to do a lot of visual thinking and design thinking exercises that you would do on a real whiteboard, uh, you know, in a meeting room. So. Uh, visual thinking helps bring a lot of people together, express ideas a lot faster. The other thing, again, this is aligned with what uh, Subrata mentioned in uh, in the later half is, uh, you know, the mindset. Uh, McKinsey had uh, published a report in 2019, like just before all the lockdowns and everything that uh, AI is ready for business, but is business or our businesses ready for AI? Uh, I think what the pandemic did is it just flipped that switch where suddenly everybody was uh, not just ready, but they were like falling over themselves to, you know, adopt, adopt AI uh, faster and quicker and so on. Agreed. Agreed. Great. Great. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Rabin. Yep. Yep. Sorry. Uh, apologies for that. It's all about employee productivity, keeping them, you know, giving their best productivity out uh, as much as possible and keeping the downtime level down. So coming to this point, uh, you know, uh, Serge, we see problem solving at scale requires a lot of talent. It needs multiple different skill sets, functions, and so on. And you have been investing a lot in India. So what, in your experience of managing AI and analytical teams and so on and so forth, what kind of competencies, the top ones which you see are required uh, currently in this particular industry. So what do you think is the need of the art? 
Yeah, I think that's a great point because this is something that also today in, in our GCC we're emphasizing a lot is to get our employees ready for the future. Yeah? So we launched an initiative uh, this year and basically our vision is that to be ready for the future, right? For employees to be ready for the future that is very close to us no? in the next one, two, three years uh, and for some even already today. People need to have uh, one of three types of profiles. That's how we see it, right? So people who are today in, in a typical GCC background, people tend to be generalists, are able to move into different types of, uh, of roles. We see that this is not the profile of the future because you have so much automation happening. You have transformation, you know, digital platforms coming in that will make a lot of those more transactional back office type operations completely obsolete. So employees will need to choose how they will specialize in the future, right? And then one of those profiles of the future clearly is analytics. You become a data scientist, data engineer, et cetera, clearly. Um, second, and we split the two, a tech profile, because we, we use a lot of tech in, in our operations. No? We have uh, different tools that you use for account reconciliation that you use in your P2P cycle, in your OTC, in supply, demand forecasting, everything. You use specific platforms, right? And we need people in the operation who are experts in those platforms. Because how often you know, have we implemented a platform and we're using 20% of the functionalities of the platform? Because people have just been trained on the very basics and nobody really knows all the additional features that you can, they can, you can use in that platform. So second profile is you become a real tech expert in one or more of those platforms and you optimize the usage of those of those platforms for, for the business. Right? And the third role is a domain expert. You are a HR professional. You're a chartered accountant. Uh, you have deep commercial expertise in, in a certain area. Um, that's the third one. And you know, to, to run analytics projects, you need a combination of those of those profiles, right? You cannot just run an analytics project with a group of data scientists, data engineers, and, and hope that they will fix uh, a specific problem or solve uh, a specific problem, right? Uh, so you need you need that combination of people who have domain expertise, have analytics expertise, and you need to teach them how to 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 talk to each other. Because what we saw when we started this journey a couple of years ago is that the data scientist doesn't understand the business. The people in the business, they have no clue what is possible with analytics. They think analytics is, uh, you know, is, uh, is Six Sigma, is Pareto charts and uh, things like that. So a lot of people in the business do not understand what is the potential of real predictive, prescriptive types of, uh, of analytics. So when we started off our journey, we put everybody together, but people were not collaborating or were not able to really understand each other. So I think here really physically sitting, sitting people together two, three years ago accelerated that a lot because the analytics people started learning, man, how does this operation work? How does the business process work? Learn the terminology to a certain extent. And the people in the, in the business operation, uh, what is what does it mean this type of correlation what does this r coefficient mean uh, so they start understanding a little bit more how analytics works and what is the the potential so i think in, for the future people who are in analytics need to understand to a certain extent the business yeah? so we're trying to expose our data scientists in different domains uh, in the business and, and i'm very happy to see that a lot of our data scientists today can really sit at the table with us and debate uh, you know, how we need to improve, let's say, this overview forecasting, what are the key drivers. They really already understand the business to a certain extent, which makes the models, of course, a lot more, a lot more successful. On the other hand, people in that operation, they need to get the, basics insi the basic insights of what AI can do, what, what does it mean, AI, uh, which are the different types of techniques. To a certain extent, they need to understand that language as well. Awesome. Great. I, I, I get the whole thing. Uh, Shubha, uh, tech, data science analytics, domain expertise, and also exposing your analytics person to multiple functions so that they understand the respective challenges. Anything else, you know, briefly, you could top it up, what Sergey mentioned. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, what Serge mentioned is, is a crux of the issue. I think uh, in spite of all the great technologies and that huge computing power at our disposal, 
I think the biggest challenge is the adoption and implementation. Uh, many a times we need to we, we tend to forget that analytics and AI are not a deploy and forget kind of you know technology implementation. It is a continuous effort because I will take a very simple example. So we were building a and today we are talking of great uh, attrition and great resignation. All of those things are going on globally, right? Now uh, a few years back when we were looking at uh, from a people analytics perspective that can be model and attrition and predict it. Now, a very simple you know, feature like uh, the residence or, or the, uh, the home, the hometown of an employee could play a role in attrition, right? That means a person who is from Delhi based out of Bangalore may want to go back to Delhi. The person who is in Bangalore but actually resides in Maleshwaram area, I mean, I don't know how many people of you are aware of, but basically to uh, you know, go for a job which is closer to uh, their residence, right? Now, it, suddenly the pandemic comes, the entire uh, utility of those features go away because everybody is based out of their hometown or whatever they you know, are comfortable and working from home. Now, how do you predict attrition? Now, if we just deploy that model and forget and, and start using the outcomes of that, and then obviously it, it will lose its, uh, uh, you know, relevance, right? So what I'm trying to get to get here is that that understanding the domain and the context and the environment, which is so fast changing, especially the business environment is so fast changing, is it's very important. The other aspect is that, again, going to what Serge mentioned, which I have seen extremely important is uh, you will buy a product or you will adopt a practice which you understand, which you believe in. And at the, at the core of belief is understanding. And I, and I jokingly tell my data scientists that always understand, remember that what is in you know, your random forest to you is black forest pastry to the business user. So bring those two together. I mean, you have to explain in, in business language what it means. I mean, if you are telling, um, you know, to, 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 we will do the classification. I mean, what is this classification? Go to that brass tax of business because it is the business which is driving and our technology, AI or ML or data science or whatever we call it uh, you know it is it is uh, it is ultimately an enabler of a business because one thing oh, since you know be it in the mainframe days and the ENIAC days and until now at the time of edge computing and quantum computing one thing which has remained constant that there is a customer for which the business exists you have to make a sale to the customer you have to service the customer and meet the customer happy and you have to run your business with the lastest operating efficiency to make your money. Tell me what has changed in so many thousand years. I'm sure in, in a, you know, even in Roman days, if somebody was a grocer was selling a shop, I mean, set up a shop, it would have been the same. Now, if we don't understand that or we tend to deny that, how can we expect the business to understand that what are we bringing to the table? And I think one of the things that we do embed our data analytics uh, practice with the so-called role of business analyst. Now, this business analyst is a little bit of a, a misnomer in many places I see. This is not the business analytics I'm talking about. I'm talking of a business analyst we are, who are typical business people who are sitting between the business user and the, the data scientist, and who is, you know, which, which is typically a famous role in the, in the technology development world, which we are adopting in the, in the data science and uh, AI world as well. Great. Uh, Dan, coming to you, uh, can I take it that design thinking is also one, one, you are an expert in that. So design thinking is something which needs to be also one of the core competency and skill set which organization need to think to right now? Yeah, absolutely. See, in fact, I think uh, uh, Subro and Serge actually covered in bits and pieces everything that I wanted to say, right? So uh yes design thinking now within design thinking there are three primary pillars right within that mindset so like subro had his three c's earlier i also have three c's for this so uh you know there's curiosity creativity and communication and uh you know what uh sir just mentioned that is curiosity basically as as a data scientist i'm also a designer uh, I want to know the, the perspective of all the stakeholders involved. That's what I'm curious about. I want to understand what the business leaders want to uh, achieve. I want to understand what the customers want to achieve. I want to understand what the process owners want to achieve and make sure that all of those goals are in line with, uh, you know, how I'm designing my algorithm and how I'm delivering uh, my results. Awesome. 
the second thing is yeah no, no, no. You, you're absolutely back on yes uh, the back. second thing is creativity right you, you want to make sure that you're open to different ways of uh, designing a particular solution and you're not sticking to just one way of doing it especially given the current situation because it's become that much harder to collaborate with other people so that open mindedness and bringing creativity to the table is fairly important and uh, the third is communication and i think uh, subroto summed it up very well when he said you know uh, for you it is random forest but for uh, you know the other party it might be uh, black forest that's exactly what it's all about right you want to be able to I, i've seen this in meetings people glazing over getting confused and asking the question right what do you mean so you know that that to me is a key skill uh, communication or storytelling whatever you want to call it but if if you look at all these three they come together to form uh, you know the entire spectrum of everything that a good design thinker or uh, a designer needs to have great i'm, I'm just being cognizant of our time right now and um, if i have to get to the final question for today and that we'll probably proceed to the uh, you know audience questions as well um anupam to start with you if i may um you have tons of experience of adopting this problem solving at scale with ai right now practically you know you have got this ex- you know implemented across if organizations were to kick start this what would be your top 3 recommendations for stakeholders or decision makers to take care of uh, in terms of problem solving at scale with ai adoption with their organizations yeah the brief, uh, brief. sure uh, let's get straight to the point the first thing has to be a common intent right so for it to, what do we mean by scale when we when we when we talk about ai at scale we're talking about it at an enterprise level and i think that's a big challenge because usually all large organizations are split up into multiple businesses or multiple lines of businesses and often the strategic priorities might differ right if strategic priorities across these businesses are not aligned then you necessarily cannot scale something across the enterprise because it's serving different purposes Right. so if you really want to do ai at scale ai has to be the objectives of ai have to be aligned to the strategic priorities of the enterprise and not necessarily only of a particular business unit or a particular small organization within the enterprise i think that's extremely important that's more from a business user perspective now underneath that once that begins to happen your machine learning models have to be built in a way that they can scale well as you throw more and more data at them right usually i've seen a lot of failure points begin to happen the moment you uh, build a model on a respectively uh, you know comparatively smaller population but then you begin to scale it at a level that it was not prepped for you would definitely see failure points there right so from a technology standpoint your machine learning models have to be built in that manner that they are ready to scale and that requires a completely different mindset to start with and the third thing which i think is extremely important uh is to make sure that your underlying data and infrastructure itself is a true horizontal that enables scalability across the enterprise you cannot scale ai if your underlying data assets are disparate or are fragmented if your data is not standardized if the production systems are stand alone that that those are also uh, hurdles to true scalability right so to summarize i think intent and and context partnership with the business to be able to decide the right problems make sure your machine learning models themselves are built for scalability and there's the right technology infrastructure for it to be able to scale absolutely you are in it for a long uh, you know it's just not a small tactical approach but it's a strategic priority and exactly. it needs to be modular and scalable as well you just can't rip and replace any any particular model right now at this stage awesome great uh shubho to your thoughts what are your top recommendations for stakeholders to adapt this uh, problem solving at scale with ai i think the biggest thing is that uh, they need to see the potential and and map it effectively to the business requirement and i will i will talk a bit about this mad rush of newer technologies and these buzzwords which are coming up now every technology need not be the right solution for every business because the business has a different from their sizes their patterns their customer profiling uh, there could be b2b business there is a b2c business and therefore the technology adoption would be different the same way when you talk of ai uh, we need to uh, define the 
most important thing is to define the use case because uh, honestly speaking i always keep telling the data scientists or, or the, the ai uh, technologies that what you did in your uh, earlier uh, project may not be the best here so we focus on the use case and not the used case so it is it is more important that you understand the context and define your solution with a with a combination of the tool technology and the intent and also one important aspect especially when we talk of design thinking and, and dan is here is that the various actors in play that who are actually contributing to the entire uh, experience and uh, whether and, and i think serge mentioned some time back that whether it, the finance is my uh, stakeholder or uh, hr is my stakeholder or marketing is my stakeholder uh, so appropriately even in a simple you know exercise of a data visualization i might need to uh, think differently for different business users the same goes with the stakeholder side also they need to see that what is best suited for them and i give i'll give you a very classic example from our all state world actually every year we do a, a do a, a so called if you can call it as a symposium or a workshop with the business users in prioritizing because many a times business wants the world because i, I don't know who mentioned this that uh, you know ai is not it's not harry potter's wand actually it will it's not going to solve every problem and we need to spell out very consciously and confidently that these are limitations and these could be done because one aspects we keep missing out is at the bandwidth when i talk of bandwidth in terms of the talent bandwidth that i may take up lot of projects but i may not be able to deliver so let us be realistic and therefore the business needs is an extreme help or ex extensive help in terms of prioritization because honestly speaking they are under the pressure of market and they want to deliver everything at the speed of uh, thought i mean they in you know, a business at the speed of thought right that is what they want but uh, you know, nobody has unlimited resources be it computing power or be the talent so we need to create that sweet spot that we, what is deliverable and what is the what are the priorities and many a times what we do and even currently we are doing this that we are deprioritizing some of the work because with the changing business landscape some of the work may become uh, of lesser priority which can wait or which are no longer relevant so those kind of uh, continuous uh, an iterative vision or iterative revisit revisit uh, uh, i would say revision and the revisiting of the strategy has to be there and i think anupam was talking about the enterprise ai as scaling at uh, the ai embedded into the enterprise strategy so no strategy is is you know universal or eternal strategies change and that's why they are called strategies right and therefore the ai and ml or whatever you know uh, automation we are bringing in that has to bake into roll into at the same time feed into each other that is Absolutely. that will be my absolutely wonderful i i think it in a sense it also answers some of the queries which we've been receiving from the audience as well and upon you spoke about how uh, machine learning models needs to be scalable uh, just not about that and it, it really answers one of that question but also i'm just uh, shooting out to you in relative similarity of the same question ai is actually immensely powerful and useful now data engineers how are organizations and talents within like data engineers for specifically uh, ensure that they deploy the models effectively and very efficiently right so what we uh, the, for that for that to be understood i think the starting point has to be seen that what are the hurdles to actually being able to do that where do we run into a problem in being able to effectively deploy models right the most important hurdle that i have seen in my experience as well the business saying that we we can't take this because there is inherent risk in deploying a, a probabilistic approach and we are used to doing the business a certain way right and usually you know the, that that's the uh, problem that most uh, ai uh, adoption challenges come up with so uh, what i have seen help is essentially speak the language of the business right search made this point so we made the point earlier that you can't be a data scientist speaking your own language you have to sit with the business speak their language and help them understand that what you're building how will it enhance the overall outcomes right that's the first part you have to work in partnership with the business right from day one 
you have to be a collaborative partner. You not you cannot build a solution sitting in a silo and expect the business to adopt it when you've built it, when they have absolutely no idea what you've been working on. I've seen that fail so many times that I cannot tell you, right? So business needs to understand what problem are you solving for them? What problem? How are you solving it? Well, they won't care, right? That's where the whole random forest versus black forest thing becomes uh, relevant. They don't care if you're using random forests or GLMs or, you know, or what you're, that's not important. What will it do? How confident are you in putting the stake in the ground and saying that, yes, I'm committing to you that this is the accuracy with which we'll be able to get to the business outcome. Put a stake in the ground and, and take that risk and work with the business, build trust, and only then you will be able to, over a period of time, see an improvement in adoption. So in my experience, working collaboratively with the business and building trust over a period of time, taking accountability for what you're doing, all of those are, are critical ingredients to improve adoptability or you know adoption of, of AI into core operations. Hey, Praveen, may, can I make a comment here yes, uh, yes, to, sure. uh, as an extension of Anupam's thing? One of the things that I think all of us need to focus if we really want to adopt AI at scale is the coaching and education of the businesses themselves. And, and many of them don't understand that the, how this from data to decisions, this whole quant, um, you know, continuum works and, and what are the typical challenges. And therefore, the adoption also fails or at least struggles, I would say. And I will take a very simple example uh, to get the best decisions you need, need to. I mean, it's a you know uh, garbage in, garbage out. You know, very simply put, right? Yep. Now a huge uh, and and it is a old adage in the data science world that you spend a more major time in cleaning up the data than building the model, right? It is it is a uh, universal truth. Now you clean up the data, you build the model, and you deploy it. Now look at from the business user perspective. They are the one who are manufacturing the data, so to say, their business functions. Now, instead of a zip code, they put in an alpha something and they are OK with that. If they are not educated that today your mistake is going to cost me tomorrow in deploying a model, they will never do that. Right. So we need to do that. The second thing is that whether the model is run at a time. So before my annual sales planning at the end of you know, in the Q4 of a year for the next year, you know, the business should be uh, you know, enthused enough to run the model and see that which region would do good for this product. Right. That is the second part of it, whether they are really using the tool as it is. Third part of it is the whether taking the decisions using that tool. If they if this, uh, you know, my model says that the propensity to, um, you know, uh, you know, to get th this product getting bought is more in the southern region and, and the chief marketing officer or the, or the revenue officer, whatever it is, whosoever it is, feels that my gut feel says that it is going to be the western region and doesn't pay heed to it. So that is again another problem. So if they understand that where are we coming from and, and that is the amalgamation or the uh, alignment which is needed for becoming AI at scale, because AI at scale is, is again is not a technology problem to my mind. It is a mindset problem and the rest of the things will follow because when, when, when we are all aligned to that. I, I couldn't agree more totally. Stakeholders needs to be invested in this. As you rightly called out earlier, you know, it's just not about defining the use case or where do we need to grow, where do we need to adapt, but the education, sheer education of people to understand what could be possible and what's not possible and stay invested in this. Dan, your thoughts on the same thing. What's your top recommendation for stakeholders trying to adopt this? Uh, so one, I, I think I hate talking after Subro because he just covers everything that I want oh, to man. say. <laughs> no, but okay, really, no, more, no more answers from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I think it's it's great listening to you. But yes, so one thing he said is absolutely correct. Uh, educating stakeholders is very important because, uh, you know, as somebody who organizes these uh, workshops, I have literally held therapy sessions uh, where one function is talking to the other function and telling them how they are responsible for, you know, problems that we are facing because you do not do your data entries properly because you do not use your formulas properly. Uh, I've had workshops where, uh, you know, we're trying to solve uh, uh, problems around simple things like templates and calculations and KPIs. And all of these things would be resolved if there is the right kind of uh, framework and education done with stakeholders. The other thing that people need to realize is that AI is not a magic pill, which is, again, I think what Subrota mentioned. You know, it's not a cure-all. It doesn't help. 
Uh, the thing that does help and something I've seen help before is, uh, again, an aspect of design thinking, which is rapid prototyping and fear fast. Uh, combined, you know, you, you can have it combined yes. with agile methodologies, but some that is something that works pretty well, where what you want to do is create low fidelity, low risk, uh, rapidly adaptive uh, models, which you can evolve and implement uh, through rapid iterations. And, uh, you know, you can plan your uh, agile based release plans or those as well. So something like that works pretty well. Great. Awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to the last question for the day today. And I want interesting question from the audience. And Serge, I would like you to take that question, right? India is now a land of youth and millennials. Uh, you, you, as you rightly said, you started out with 15, 16 people. The question from the audience is, are 38 million students currently enrolled in higher education institutes. They're all network at the same time. Now, if we need to get them to experiment, test, record, and understand for problem solving, uh, you know, at scale with AI, what is your recommendation to transform this tremendous opportunity potential, the human capital potential from India? What's your recommendation? Yeah. Well, I think that is the huge potential of India. And that's one of the reasons, or the, probably the main reason why we opened the office here is the, the huge talent pool that we have already today and that we will continue having in, in the future. No? So we, we collaborate a lot with, with universities. We go to universities around the, uh, the country. Uh, and so our office today is around 1,800 people. Uh, we have around 350 people in that 1,800 that are data scientist, data engineer profiles. And so coming from 15, uh, now around 350, just as a context, to tell you the number of interns and the number of campus hires that we recruit every year. Every year we have 100, 120 interns. Uh, this year is going to be even more. It's probably going to go in the direction of 200. Uh, and we hire every year somewhere between 100 and 120 campus uh, hires, IITs, IMs, even ISB. Uh, and so we, we bring those interns in. We have internships from two months, three months, even six months and we put them on real life problems. So they work with us as they would work with uh, in a, as a normal employee. They interact directly with people in the business. They work on real problem cases. Um, so I think that is one big investment that we are doing and I see other companies doing as well is really reaching out to universities, bringing in that top talent and giving them the exposure to real life business problems. Because again, you can, you can be the best uh, developer uh, or scientist or a statistical expert at in college, but you need to then apply it, of course, in the, in the business context. So I think this connection with with universities, doing internships, hiring from campus, I think is very important. And the second thing that we do is, and again, a lot of companies are doing is is the competitions. You know? Do an analytics competition. Um, you you would be surprised the number of of uh, volunteers that you get. You literally get thousands of people applying to participate uh, in this type of AI uh, challenges that we do at some of the top campuses. That's, uh, that's an awesome insight. I, I, it's definitely, I think, the future lies behold for everybody to take, uh, especially invest in India, you know, with the tremendous potential of human capital. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for your uh, views or search. Uh, I thank you know Serge, Anupam, Dan, and Shubhu for all your views. Thank you so much for taking your time out and sharing with us. With this, uh, this is the third event of the three series uh, leadership roundtable session. For especially today's topic at problem solving at scale, I think today what essentially we got out is the real playbook from all of you, uh, right from the basic strategy to what organizations who have already adopted could do more. Uh, it's wonderful speaking to most of you and audience questions were phenomenal. I really love the audience questions as well. If there are any questions which we haven't answered today, we will definitely make sure, you know, we reach out back to you, maybe give you them uh, at your suitable time. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking your time once again. Uh, wonderful speaking to you. At Dell Technologies, we take pride in engaging with such thought leadership. Meet you again sometime, some other day, some other platform. Take care. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you so much.